Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. St. Louis went viral for all the right reasons last month. The Wall Street Journal published an essay comparing our response to the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic to Philadelphia's. The essay concluded St. Louis was the city to emulate. Dr. Jonathan D. Quick wrote, St. Louis had the most success of any large American city in fighting the pandemic. Dr. Quick credited Health Commissioner Max Starkloff, who banned public gatherings even as Philadelphia cluelessly went forward with a public parade. Ultimately, he wrote, St. Louis's mortality rate was half of Philadelphia's. The Wall Street Journal's conclusions were soon everywhere, and the St. Louis of 102 years ago got credit for its foresight and good judgment. But as Chris Nafziger explores in a new column in St. Louis magazine, the real story is a little bit more complicated, and he's here today to explain some of the reasons why. So, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, sir. I really appreciate it. Now, Chris, your essay was such a fascinating read. I want to really encourage everybody to go to stlmag.com to to read this piece. Um, But you really put St. Louis's success with the flu in context. This was a really bad time in the city, and there was more than one bad time. Even if we did uh, better than Philadelphia, how bad did things get in St. Louis? It, It got really bad. And I think what's important for people to realize is that Definitely a lot of what's been in the national press recently about how St. Louis did crack down on on closing, uh, you know, businesses, particularly theaters, was one major focus. Also, um, the archbishop at the time also closed all the Catholic churches and many other church leaders as well. However, Surprisingly, a lot of things were actually still open. One thing uh, that I was actually really surprised is that all the public transit, uh, you know, St. Louis is very famous for its streetcar mm-hmm. um, system, which, you know, is completely gone now. It's hard to believe that it once existed. It actually stayed open. Hmm. Um, and actually, the only thing that they advised was to keep all the windows open. They actually nailed the windows open because they believe that uh, wind blowing through the cars would keep uh, the infections down. Hmm. That's an interesting theory. uh, It was. And also another thing, I I did some research as well. Um, St. Louis was infamous for its pollution. And while certainly they closed factories uh, to not spread infection between workers, uh, there still would have been a a huge amount of air pollution. And and my research has shown that uh, the National Institutes of Health, that uh, particular air pollution is a major factor um, still to this day for people having weakened um, lungs, which leads to more infections. Mm -hmm. So St. Louis definitely, definitely pioneered a a lot of things that are, are still very beneficial for us to learn to today. But I, as I said, my comment is nuanced. Uh, there were still many things that um, they could learn from uh, from us today. You know, one of the things I, I found really interesting in your column is, um, you know, there's all this debate right now about should we close the parks. It, yes. Back in 1918, they still allowed tennis matches to go on. Yes, and that, so that was actually a little bit later. That was in 1920, and, and uh, Dr. Starkloff seemed to mellow out a little bit. He, hmm. he did allow tennis matches, and there was this interesting story about them all, the different high schools like Cleveland, um, you know, Soldan. Um, he did actually, in 1918, end most sports competitions, and people were pretty angry about it. But it's actually very interesting. They did allow some college games, and I actually did some research, and I discovered – um, that they allowed St. Louis University to play McKendry College, but the gates were locked, and they actually had the National Guard guarding the football field to prevent spectators from watching the football game. And uh, SLU defeated McKendry, I think, 79-0. to zero. Um, So they did allow some sporting events to continue, but they actually had armed guards, from National Guard soldiers, to prevent people from congregating in the stands. So the players were potentially um, contaminating each other, but nobody in the stands was getting infected. Right. Yeah, the stands were empty. Interesting. (laughs) Now, you know, bigger picture, you also made, I thought, a really interesting point here. You compared us, unlike just looking at St. Louis versus Philadelphia, you compared St. Louis to other Midwestern cities, and you came to the conclusion that maybe we weren't um, the gold standard shining beacon that we've thought of ourselves as being. 
you know, isn't there an old saying that you can basically make statistics say whatever you want them to say? And I want to stress that by no means am I saying that we should not learn the lesson. St. Louis and what Dr. Starkloff taught us from 1918 is still an incredibly valuable lesson and it's about social distancing. It does work. However, as far as if we look at, for example, Minneapolis, Minneapolis had a far lower uh, rate of infection and death than St. Louis, and actually several other Midwestern cities did as well. Hmm. Now, when we start looking at these statistics that make St. Louis look like it did far better than other major cities, that's when we compare it to Philadelphia. Pittsburgh had absolutely the worst. It was well over, I think, I, I, don't quote me on this, it was well over 1,000, if not 1,200 per 100,000 deaths. It was mm. abysmal. Um, cities like New York City were extremely high. So remember, you know, thinking back to what St. Louis's population was back then, it was approaching 800,000. It had much more in common with East Coast cities at the time, mm-hmm. um, like Boston, um, other major industrial cities uh, that were in Massachusetts at the time, like Lowell or Worcester. They had extremely, extremely bad rates. Um, we, we did better than Chicago, but in many ways, St. Louis was much more like an East Coast major industrial city, and we did do better than all of those cities. But if you look to smaller industrial cities in the Midwest, we, we did not do as well. And I think that probably had a lot to do with, again, um, the very bad coal pollution. Um, if you talk to people who are older in St. Louis, they talk about how bad the pollution was. And it wasn't for many more decades um, that St. Louis really did not uh, um, confront that really bad particulate pollution that came with that uh, very dirty uh, coal that just blanketed everything in the city. Hmm. So, Yes, it's more nuanced. Uh, we definitely, St. Louis was not the lowest major American city uh, for in, infections and death. It was, it was definitely, it was very, very, um, how should I say, it was very, very respectable. Mm-hmm. And it definitely beat out other very large industrial cities in America, but it was definitely, um, it definitely did not beat out many American cities, though. Hmm. We're talking to Chris Nafziger and his new piece in St. Louis Magazine, which you can read online at stlmag.com. It explores how St. Louis really handled the 1918 Spanish flu. As he says, it's it's not so much a corrective as just some additional information. There's a lot more nuance to this story than the one little piece of information that seems to be going viral. And and Chris, your piece also focuses on the work of St. Louis's Commissioner of Public Health. That's Dr. Max Starkloff. We actually got the opportunity yesterday to hear from his great, great, grandson. That's Christian Saller. And Christian told our producer, Emily Woodbury, some of the things that he felt made his great-great-grandfather's efforts successful. Let's listen. I think that he was not a person lacking assertiveness, uh, to put it mildly. I always, the the image I always had, the stories that I've always heard, not just in the whole context of the flu epidemic, but just at large in his personal and and public life both, uh, I think that he was known as a very a uh, forceful individual. I think that he was needy and tyrannical at times in asserting uh, his will. And I think with you know, that was to the benefit to the city of St. Louis, I think, in that um, as health commissioner, had he been a more retiring individual or one who was less likely to um, confront people and to push the agenda he felt was needed, I think that things could have been uh, possibly worse for the city had he not been able to implement or to force some of the measures that he, he sought to successfully force. What was his uh, relationship with the mayor like at that time? Well, you know, I always understood that they were they were cordial. I think that they had a, a close working relationship. I think it became more awkward and perhaps a little bit less cordial uh, during the influenza epidemic because despite what I've read some places, I always heard, again, these are largely family stories, uh, but I've always heard that the mayor was not inclined to be uh, on the same page with him as far as um, the closing businesses and restricting crowds and gatherings, et cetera, um, closing saloons and, and businesses in general. Uh, and I think that seems likely he was probably worried about the political fallout. And I can imagine him saying, well, other cities aren't doing this. And, you know, why are we having to do it? And this is going to be a disaster for me politically. And I always heard that um, – 
the health commissioner was able to find a provision in the city charter, possibly, that allowed him to override the mayor, that it wasn't that they just, you know, joined hands and agreed to uniformly fight this together. I think that it was more of him forcing the issue. And that's Christian Saller. He's the great-great-grandson of Dr. Max Starkloff, who was St. Louis's commissioner of public health. He's given us the perspective of what's been passed down in family stories from Dr. Starkloff. Um, Chris Knapsinger, how does that jive with what you learned in your research? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that that, that fits perfectly. I, I think another thing we should realize is, you know, in the early 20th century, the late 19th century, uh, German-American pride in sort of this image of the German Empire as this very strict, very uh, authoritarian government where, you know, people listen to orders. This, you know, <laughs> the Kingdom of Prussia had united Germany in 1871. And we see that in many German-American businesses, um, this idea of modeling uh, their modeling their business culture, particularly like, for example, German breweries in St. Louis, this business culture and this sort of way of following orders was based off of the Prussian military. So when I hear Christian, who, by the way, is my neighbor. Um, what a small talk, town this is. Yeah, it is. Uh, talking about how, you know, uh, Dr. Starkloff, you know, giving orders and expecting them to be followed is very much, you know, this idea that, you know, um, this Prussian militaristic idea of, you know, the way that you are successful is by, you know, uh, listening to your superiors. They are always correct, and we will have success in fighting this common enemy when everybody falls into line. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to hear Christian talk about his ancestor in that way because it makes perfect sense. It's obviously probably his personality as well. How much um, pushback, though, did Dr. Starkloff end up getting from the mayor? Uh, Christian suggests that was kind of a source of friction there. Do you think that was true? Well, I think, you know, probably uh, Christian, uh, you know, probably knows more about that than me. I think definitely, I think what's also important, I think likewise this idea of this, you know, this, this, this uh, you know, this, social culture is that also, you know, superiors also have a respect down towards their subordinates. You know, it's given both ways. Um, you know, Keel is a very fascinating mayor as well. Also, the idea that if your subordinates listen to you, that you also listen to your subordinates who have worked hard for their training. Um, you know, Dr. Starkloff was a very highly trained doctor, and therefore that you should back him up. I think that's also a very important lesson for us to learn today um, when we listen to doctors and, who, and epidemiologists who have studied this. Um, I, think, I think Dr. Keel, or not Dr. Keel, Mayor Keel, excuse me, I think he was very much kind of also following that same sort of German cultural idea of uh, superiors also um, listening to their subordinates. The and, respect goes both ways. And did the citizens of St. Louis take well to this, or were they just ready well, to fight back? Well, you know, that's a great question. I, I think certainly many people did, but also people did not. Um, and, you know, I think my favorite story about all this is that many business owners, they all planned on meeting to uh, discuss whether or not they were going to follow the Dr. Starkloff's orders about whether or not they were going to shut down. Dr. Starkloff did not, you know, go to meet them and have a discussion about whether it would happen. He sent the police to <laughs> shut down the meeting. So um, certainly, uh, beyond a doubt, and what's actually very fascinating, and people don't talk about this, on Armistice Day, which is, remember, this flu epidemic started before World War I ended. Mm -hmm. People, everybody kind of rushed out into the streets, and guess what? Uh, and they also, Dr. Starkloff himself loosened the restrictions, and they saw a spike in the number of infections. Hmm. And that's something that people don't talk about. So Dr. Starkloff even had a few missteps himself. And, but they learned from their mistakes. They saw that infections of the flu spiked after they loosened infections. They saw infections spike after Armistice Day when people went out and, you know, came into close contact after, you know, World War I ended. And they learned from their mistakes, and they cracked down, and they reimposed um, the restrictions. Same Chris, thing when they, oh, go ahead. Do we know then how long um, St. Louisans of, of that era ended up socially distancing under, under restrictions? It was, it was about two months. Um, my impression it was about two months, early October to sort of late December. It came back again in 1919 and again in 1920. Um, it wasn't as bad, but it, it kept coming back for a little while. Um, 
And do we know when it came back? Did they then go back to sort of forcing people inside again? Yeah, there were others. There was other periods as well. Uh, Yeah, definitely. Um, Yeah, that's something that doesn't get talked about as much. Um, Again, like that tennis match that I was talking about between the different high schools, that was in 1920, for example. Hmm. Um, So, yeah, there's all these, you know, they talk about this this, uh, 1918 epidemic being kind of forgotten about. Well, there were other ones in the following years that are even more forgotten about. So they sort of took one step forward, then they ended up having to take a step back. In right. terms of loosening and then tightening yeah, again. Yeah, exactly. Um, but they definitely, you know, I think that's important to, for people to realize is that they they lowered the restrictions too soon hmm. in, in November, and they had to bring them back again. So that's a, a lesson to learn as well. And Chris, in our last minute here, I just wanted to ask very quickly, what happened to the crime rate? Such a St. Louis question. What happened to the crime rate in this well, pandemic? and that's something very important to realize. Um, I gave the example in my article about this guy who lived in sort of the West End neighborhood, which is sort of north of Forest Park, not, not the central West End. His front porch being blown up with a bomb and, you know, he having no idea who did it, claiming he had no enemies. <laughs> crime did not disappear. And even, in fact, there was a letter to the editor um, signed a true American, which I loved uh, that was how they allowed the person to sign it. It does not seem like crime went down at all, necessarily. There were some parts of St. Louis, even back in the 19-teens, that had very high crime rate. I did not find any evidence that that caused um, the crime rate to go down. Hmm. Well, hopefully things will be different in our experimentation with this all today. But um, this is just so fascinating to learn about. And Chris Napsiger, I want to thank you so much for joining us today to talk about it. Thank you. And that essay, again, highly recommend it. It's at stlmag.com. And um, Chris has a lot of great St. Louis history in there, as always. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com.